Welcome to this oral history interview, part of the developing series of interviews focusing on live music venues and experiences on Route 66, centered around Springfield and Greene County, Missouri, and Lebanon and Pulaski County, Missouri. This series is supported in part by a grant from the Route 66 Corridor Preservation Program of the National Park Service. My name is Craig Amison with Missouri State University Libraries. Today's date is April 26, 2023, and our special guest today is Rule Chapel, an accomplished, lifelong musician whose recording history goes all the way back to when he was seven years old. He has played throughout his life with many bands and musicians, one of the most notable being the Ozark Mountain Daredevils. Among other career pursuits, Mr. Chapel owns his own production studio and has been working in audio production for about 50 years. I yeah. Think. Yeah. He is the director of the Southwest Missouri chapter of Play It Forward, a nonprofit that provides musical instruments for children whose families cannot afford them. And all of that really just scratches the surface. Um, this interview is taking place in the Ozarks room of the Dwayne, at the Dwayne G. Meyer Library on the campus of Missouri State University. Rule, thank you so much for being here My today pleasure. and for thank agreeing you to participate asking. with this project and talking to us. Um, the first question is going to be the toughest. When and where were you born? Springfield, Missouri, uh, Cox Hospital, North, uh, April 7th, 1954. And this one will be a little bit thought-provoking, <laughs> I think. If you had to use one word to describe what the music scene was like in Springfield during the late 1960s and into the 1970s, what would that word be? Huge. Uh-huh. I mean, I, I grew up... Uh, I guess you wanted some background. I do. I do want okay. your explanation. Uh, it, it, it was every kind of music possible mm -hmm. in one little town. Yeah. You know, we had jazz. We had uh, we had blues. We had country. Obviously, you know the uh, kind of the the uh, holdovers from the uh, uh, Ozarks Jubilee, and uh, uh, we we just had every we had big band music. Mm -hmm. You know, at the Grove, we had. I mean, there just were there were tons of different kinds of music here. I'm going to get into your memories about some of that uh, as as we go along. But before we go any further, we want to confirm that Spillwater Junction right. was the correct name for your first band. Is yeah, right? it, we might have, we might as well just named it Stillwater because that's what everyone said. But <laughs> and there, I noticed there is a Stillwater Junction band uh, ex in existence now. Oh, really? Uh, in in the south, maybe North Carolina somewhere. I'm yeah. Thinking, yeah. 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 Um, were, you were all teenagers, is that correct? Well, uh, yeah, we were in. Uh, we actually, my brother and I actually started the band mm -hmm. in elementary school. And I mean, uh, late elementary school, sixth grade, and then we actually started playing out when we went to Pipkin for junior high school. Okay. And my first gig was my girlfriend's house across the street from Smith Park, and uh, for like a birthday party or something. Or just a party? Yeah, it was just a party uh -huh. and. We played, because uh, I remember we did uh, the Herman's, Herman's, Herman's thing, Mrs. Brown, you've got to love, love her neck. <laughs> yeah. And I remember we did That's that. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, and your brother's name? Alan. Alan. He's a drummer, uh, still drums. He's, uh, in fact, we're going to do a, I wrote a song, we're getting ready to do a session. He's, he's a real good drummer, plays primarily a lot with a blues people. Okay. What, what can you tell us about that band? I mean, uh... Well, I can tell you this. Uh, Donnie Thompson was my first guitar player. Mm -hmm. And uh, Alan and I take great pride in the fact that we brought Donnie Thompson to the Springfield music scene. We literally were at Hoover Music one day. I'm trying to remember exactly how it happened. We walked in, and I don't know why we were there, but we were, and we walked by this guy playing guitar. And he... It was just really good, you know. You could just tell he was a killer. And uh, so anyway, we did our stuff, and he remained there playing. And we went up to him and said, hey, man, you want to play in a band? You know, and uh, he said, uh, I don't know. And uh, I remember uh, we talked him into it. He came to my, we, at my parents' house, of course, downstairs in the basement is where we practiced. Mm -hmm. And Donnie came there, uh, and I remember he had he had a little he had a silver tone guitar and a silver tone amp. 
And uh, we, of course, to practice that was fine, but we said, man, of course, that was a, the day of. We, we had small PA systems and huge amplifiers. Yeah, right. Now it's exactly the reverse. The opposite, yeah. You know, and, uh, but uh, we said, you know, man, we, you know, love your stuff, and, but you're probably going to need a little bit more powerful amp. So anyway, he, he ended up uh, joining us, and that was his first, first band with Spillwater Junction. And uh, shoot, I've got somewhere, I've got old pictures of him <laughs> we, uh, and us playing. Uh, and we, we had two horn players, Don Slintz and, uh, oh God, I can't, Dave, oh man, don't hold me to that, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name, see him. But, uh, uh, and uh, we also had a guy called Teddy Bear. He uh, later went to LA, Dave, uh, concourse and uh, he had a uh, uh, he went to LA and became a huge producer huh. uh, did uh, produced all of uh, uh, oh the, uh, the a lot of the uh, cop show music uh, I forget the, exactly which one but he just says he just did great and, uh, and his name was Dave concourse and he was from right here so uh, you know, and then Donnie went on to play with about everybody, including the Daredevils, mm -hmm. for a time. And uh, it's, Donnie's, uh, in fact, he's got a uh, Music Monday coming up first of, uh, oh yeah, you know, at mm -hmm. the at the Oaks Lodge. Yeah. I'm going to go and make sure that everyone knows that I brought him. <laughs> I'm gonna, you know, we'll have a point of order so that everybody knows. <laughs> you know. Do you think it's remarkable? How many times that happens where people started here and ended up? Oh my God! Well, and there? I think it's because uh, I think it's because Springfield has such a rich history of music. Uh, the railroad was here; it was full of musicians. Gene Autry mm -hmm. was an ex-railroader. He, I remember as a little kid. I, I don't remember it, but my dad took me to the yard office when Gene Autry was there, and uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the other guy's name. Wrote silver-haired. Daddy of mine. I mean, a lot of a lot of musicians came from the railroad. Yeah. And uh, then on top of that, of course, we had the Ozarks Jubilee. Uh, 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 Chet Atkins was here. Mm -hmm. You know, Brenda Lee. I, I mean, everybody was here. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, uh, the, it was just a it was just cram packed with people, and and so we had a huge music community here. You know, very, very early on, you know, early 50s. T tell me some of the other places that you're, that the Spillwater Junction played. Perhaps oh, my before. God. Every, we played about every uh, high school dance in the four-state area. Mm -hmm. I mean, just about. We, we played a lot of them. And uh, uh, we were the, there was, there was us, and then there was a group, Jim Wonderly, and those, they were the east side kids, you know, and we were the north side kids. You know, we were the bad boys, and, and so it was kind of like the Beatles and the Stones. <laughs> you know, and, and uh, we were the kids that were always in trouble, and they were the kids that you know, Fool's Face came out of, sure. and, and all those bands, and, and uh, yeah, we were the we were the the bad boys, and uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was uh, it, it, we played uh, we played a lot of gigs for frat people. <laughs> which was really weird because right out here there used to be a corral in the back of mm -hmm. the and all the frat boys would stand there and hate on us with long hair you know the really pisser was they had to we had they had to hire us for their dances you know <laughs> and so they'd hire us for our dances and then they'd it, it, they'd get drunk and of course tear up their frat house and uh, then they'd accuse us of messing with their women it, it always happened it always happened you know and uh, I can't tell you how many times I had to call the police and suggest that they fight the police. You know, mm -hmm. I, it, it, it was just, <laughs> it was bizarre. And, you know, none of that stuff happens anymore. We played, uh, we played the townhouse. There was a fight there every night. We played, uh, oh, I mean, maybe at one or two, every night. You know, I mean, they didn't shoot people, but, but it, there was fists thrown Every night, uh -huh. and uh, I played uh, Spillwater played a place in uh, called the uh, uh, 
H and B Ranch or H and R Ranch in Galena, Kansas, and that was a that was a huge uh, college age. You could drink at eighteen in Kansas, mm -hmm. and they had Coors beer, which back then was, was a, a big huge deal. deal. Right, it was illegal in Missouri. Right, so. Uh, and the, I remember we played there, and it, you remember uh, in the Blues Brothers, they had played that stage where there was wire in front. That was one of those places. Okay. <laughs> they threw beer bottles at you all night long. <laughs> and uh, it was an old chicken coop, uh, you know, big chicken house. It had one big fan blowing in at one end and one big fan blowing out. At the other. No air conditioning, no <laughs> nothing, just an aluminum building, you know. God. And, uh, and we played there a lot. And there were fights there. My, my mom, we started before we could drive. Mm -hmm. My mom took us. And she was about four foot nothing. And she'd sit right beside the stage and a big old fight would start. She'd just go like this, keep playing, keep playing. Not afraid, never afraid of anything. You know? <laughs> Jeannie, everyone respected her. She was, she was just tough as nails, you know. And uh, never, she always did all our business and no one messed with her, man. That's wonderful. Yeah, she she made sure we were paid. She made sure that everything. How many years did that band exist? Oh, we probably about ten years. Oh my gosh! You know, yeah. at least I I somewhere between eight and ten, I think. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, we went through several different players, and and uh, but uh, we were primarily central based, central high school, and and. Uh, um, uh, but yeah, it it, it was what a quite a. Time. What, what kind of music were you playing mostly? We played a kind of a little rock and roll. We played also horn band stuff. We had two horn players, and, and we could do uh, Chicago stuff and, uh -huh. and uh, Blood, Sweat, and Tears. That sure. was a big band then. And, uh, 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 yeah, that's pretty much what we played. That's we, awesome. A little rock and roll, you know. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, were you hearing and seeing live music during your teen years while you were playing? Were you hearing live music around here? Going oh, Lord, to see? yes. Tell yeah. me some of the groups you were going to see and where. Well, oh man. Uh, the, uh, oh, the Grove used to have uh, the jazz musicians and the big band guys. Mm -hmm. And I like to go hear them. Uh, there was a guy named Forrest, uh, something. I think. I'm sorry, I can't remember. This is too long ago. I, I was a kid. Uh, but anyway, they had, uh, uh, the Grove had, you know, horn bands, mm -hmm. you know. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, went there to see them. Uh, I went many, many places in town. There used to be a lot more places to play. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, yeah. there were 10 places from Glenstone and St. Louis to the square, just on St. Louis. Right. You know, there were Ducks Beer Garden, and, and there were there were a million places to play. So right. th back in the day, and uh, you know, and then we we I I played. Uh, I used to go uh, um, on several different occasions to hear uh, the the Black Trio, uh, uh, Dallas Bartley, mm -hmm. and, uh, right. Bebop Brown, and Dave Bedell play. Right. And then uh, at several different uh, corner of Glenstone and Kearney was there. There was a club there. Uh, the Lamplighter, of course, was Dave Bedell and, and uh, uh, Rocky Helwig, and uh, I can't. Remember. I don't. I don't know if it was Bebop. I don't think that was Bebop. Some other uh, dude, but they, you know, they were the older generation. And I right. always dug them because they knew all the chords. Yes. You know, sure. and there was always something to learn from them. Uh, when Nick and I started playing, uh, we, we used to go see uh, Slim Wilson and Bill Ring. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, half of Nick and I's thing was just talking, you know, goofing around with the audience, you know, mm -hmm. and just, you know, smiling, telling jokes and stuff like that. And we got all that from watching Bill Ring. Yes. He was and, part of showing, you know, oh yeah. yeah, him and Slim, half their, you know, and we didn't have to have as many songs, you know. We could just talk our way through the evening, you know, and mm -hmm. and but people liked that. They, you know, it, it wasn't this thing. And I always tell band members, you know, uh, don't get up there and just say, okay, here's another song. Here's another song by, you know, here's another song by, 
no one gives a crap. You know, they they want you to they want you to pull them in. Yeah. To your thing, whatever that is, and and uh, that's one thing I love about the Daredevils is, you know, they 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 had that down early, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, they always made it about everybody else, you know, and and uh, uh, the the group that was listening to them, and uh, you know, they were good readers of the crowd, and uh, it, it you know that it, it made. Uh, I think that's a. I think that's kind of a lost art, <coughs> is because people don't know. They, they may be great musicians, but they may not relate to the crowd whatsoever. Right. The interaction. Yeah, right. and that is so key, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, it's just a huge deal. Well, speaking of the Daredevils, you joined the uh, this Springfield-based Ozark Mountain Daredevils in 1976. Yeah. Is that correct. Yeah, I was going to be. Time. Yeah, yeah. I, for the first time. Yeah, and I was going to be a uh, teacher. I went to SMS U teacher. I mean SMS mm -hmm. Teachers College, right. you know, Southwest Missouri State Teacher. Or, what were you going to teach? I was going to teach math. Okay. And uh, Dr. Ali was here, and uh, uh, he was one of my favorite teachers. That was not a mathematician. He taught education. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he was just wonderful. But anyway, uh, I got all the way through. They took my money and everything. And uh, said, okay, you can graduate now. So I went to do my student teaching. Mm -hmm. And they assigned me to Greenwood. And so I went into my uh, this guy to talk about Greenwood. And uh, I was... Just walked in and said, "Hi, and my name's Rule, and you know, and I'm, I guess I'm going to do my student teaching at Greenwood." He said, "Not with that hair, you're not." <laughs> so I said, "Well, that just leaves me out then. See ya." Uh -huh. And I went home. Yeah. And it was that very day, Buddy Brayfield called me, who was the original piano player with the Daredevils, and uh, said, uh, I'm going to leave and become a doctor. We, uh, Buddy and I had went to school at Drury for a year. I, I was a really good math, mathematician. Mm -hmm. I loved math, mm -hmm. loved it, loved science, loved math. And uh, I was uh, one of three people, and they are much smarter than me. I still know them to this day. That I was one of three people that got to go to Drury on a special co uh, math grant. Mm -hmm that allowed us to take uh, uh, freshman calculus when we were seniors in high school. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so uh, it was really, really cool. And uh, uh, the two other people uh, got, one got a, a fully full ride to uh, Harvard and one got one to Yale. That's amazing. Yeah, I, I, to this day, I tell those guys, this, I don't know how I made it. <laughs> I really don't. So, so you knew Brayfield, y'all? I knew Buddy real well. Yeah. Were, were you musical or just because you were? Well, uh, because I had actually, I had done some uh, uh, PA work for them. Okay. It wasn't called Sound Company back then, you know, they needed a PA. And, uh -huh. and I had a PA, and so mm -hmm. uh, at their early shows here in Springfield, a couple of times I ran the PA and, mm -hmm. and recorded them. So you were already familiar with the group? Oh, yeah. I, was, I knew everybody in the mm -hmm. group. Sure. My brother knew everybody in the group. And, and uh, so Buddy called me up. I mean, it was if it was not the same day, it was the next day. And, and it was just like fate, you know. Yeah. And I'm so glad, by the way, that it worked out the way it did. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I could have lasted in uh, teaching. I just don't anymore. But uh, I'm glad it worked out the way it did. And uh, so I joined the Daredevils. I was scared to death. I, I'm, I didn't know. See, Buddy just set it up. And so I showed up for practice. And I knew all these guys, and they knew me, but not in that role. And, right. you know, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm probably six years younger than Dylan. Okay. And, you know, three years younger than Soup. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Nick's a year older than me. So I was like the youngest guy mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. group. Yeah. And uh, Larry Lee was in the group at that time. Really and, intimidating. Uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. God. And, you know, I was scared to death to do anything. And, and, but they were really good. And, and I think we practiced two days. And we went to our first gig in uh, uh, 
Steamboat Springs, Colorado okay. on a tour. And uh, it was a goofy tour. It started out, uh, the first night was in Steamboat Springs. The next night was in Boston, prime across the United States. And then we went into Canada and did the Canadian tour all the way across and down the West Coast. Right. And I, you know, I was just, I could not believe anything like that. I practiced two days with them. And then we were off, you know. I'm going to ask a silly question. Yeah. Did you know all their songs already? No. I knew most of them. <laughs> I knew most of them. Uh, I, and I knew most of them from just being there. And like I said, I learned music by listening. So, you know, and working in uh, like the studio all the time, which is what I did. We worked by chord charts. Mm -hmm. And you, you write a chord chart just by listening. Okay, right. one, one, four, mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. you sure. know. And, and then it's improvisation after that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but, uh, so I knew most of their songs. But, I mean, there was some in-depth stuff, especially Larry Lee's stuff. Was a little more jazzy and a little softer, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, Within Without and Spaceship Orion and, and that stuff that was a long way from Chicken Train, you uh -huh. know. Sure. And that was, it was kind of one of the neat things about the group. But at the same time, you know, it was uh, uh, Lee eventually, Lee left for his own career. Chowning was gone by the time I got to the band. We had the guy, uh, Runa Wally from Norway. He played with the Flying Norwegians and just was whole, there was about a million funny stories about that guy. He could just barely speak English. And he was hilarious. He, he was just a Viking, you know. He'd just <laughs> walk in a bar and grab up a girl and you know, and just drag her onto the dance floor, and and, and you know, meanwhile her boyfriend's going, what, uh, you know, and he he told this one guy one time, uh, he said, uh, Sam Condor, he called him a Condor, and I did, I didn't know, you know, it's just so weird, you know? <laughs> and we laughed so much at him. He was so funny, such a brilliant guy, great guitar. But he couldn't speak English very well. Uh, but yeah, we so we did the, the Steamboat Springs thing. Well, okay, very first day I wake up and, and go downstairs after the first gig. But that went good. Okay, we're, you know, everything's going to be okay. And I go down and ask the front desk, where uh, is, are any of the other daredevils up? And she said, oh, they left a half hour ago. I went, what? She said, oh, yeah, they they took the only two cabs and... and down to Denver to fly out. So I ran back upstairs. I was rooming with Steve Kennedy, who passed away since then. And uh, I never will forget, I was freaking out. And I, I said, Steve, Steve, we've been left, man. What are we going to do? We, we've been left. And he was a Vietnam pilot guy. And he said, first things first, rule, let's eat. <laughs> I never will forget. I, my life is just full of crap like that. <laughs> just like, oh. But uh, we made the gig, and he chart, he got us there. You know, he put together our own plane flights. We, I think we flew down to Denver in a crop duster, and you know, it was it was bizarre. But. Uh, uh, Anyway, that's that's where I started with the Daredevil. Is that the most you had traveled when you were touring with them? Had you... Oh my God, yes. Yeah. By far. Uh -huh. I mean, I, we went to Canada. We went everywhere. Yeah. You know. So that must have been. A... Yeah, it was really cool. It was an eye opener. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got chastised all the time. I got told by Steve Cash never to leave the room when I was in the, the hotel when I was in New York. I said, do not leave this hotel because they would lose me. I would just be out walking around, you know. And they'd say, you don't, don't do that, you know. <laughs> they, and uh, because, I, you know, I've never been to any of these places, right, you right, know. Sure. And uh, we used to go to L.A. And, and stay at the Chateau where all the rock people stayed. And, you know, I got to, I got to see, uh, you know, Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols. And I was, mm -hmm. that was bizarre, you know. I'd never seen people like that. Right. And uh, remember the first time we walked out to the pool, uh, in the 70s, there not a girl had a top on, right on Sunset Strip, mm -hmm. right there. 
and I did what any red-blooded American boy would do. I ran back to my room and started calling everybody. <laughs> said, you will not believe this. <laughs> yeah. Of course you did. <laughs> it was great. And, uh, you know, it was my, it, it was just, it was just really, I, I enjoyed it. I mean, I, I wouldn't take a million dollars for it. It was such a yeah. great experience, you know. So you, you, were, you were with them for a few years and you went to Pensacola for, for a few years. Right? right. But sort of coming back and forth. Right, I, yeah. I I played with Nick, and uh, they were going. They had lost their deal with uh, uh, a record deal, and it was going to get sparse. They were, mm -hmm. you know, they kind of went through the uh, a time where there were five, uh, four or five guys, and uh, which was really great too. I, I and I was a huge partier. I oh, it you know I'd wake up places and you know Canada not know where I was mm -hmm. sure. and uh, uh, so anyway they probably were great without me for that time but uh, um, and I, uh, so anyway I, I thought I'm gonna go to Florida oh disco happened mm -hmm. and this town went to hell in a handbasket musically <laughs> I mean there everyone had a turntable you know, there's a nickel and the whatevers and the, and they all had a DJ. Mm -hmm. There weren't, there was, you know, live music was gone. Well, on the Gulf Coast, uh, my family was primarily Southern. And um, on the Gulf Coast, there was live, you could play. Yeah. So I went down there and uh, still playing on and off with Nick. And, and then we got Ned and um, they came down and played a few times. And I came back here and played a few times. I had a restaurant and uh, thought that's what I wanted to do was own a restaurant and play at it and I hated it, hated the, the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. And so we sold it about a year later. Luckily there was a guy who wanted to buy it and uh, then I came back and I started playing around here again and, uh, and doing work in the studio. And you were doing solo work and other ensemble oh, yeah. work during that when you when you came back too. Yeah, Nick Nick and I Ned uh, played a lot. Yeah. Uh, you know Nick and Rule and Ned the band. The, the reason I asked that I, I saw I saw an ad uh, that said uh, the Rule Chapel band. Would that have been the three of you, or would that have been other ensembles? Or? Well, I don't know. I can't really remember ever using my name as a band. They probably just decided. To Maybe do that. that's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, uh, that that happened uh, one sure time when Nick and <laughs> Nick and I and Ned went to Pensacola, Florida, and we were advertised as Rule Chapel and Big Bottom Reggae, <laughs> and the people were just they we got a roll thrown at us you know, <laughs> from the back of the room. That's even before Lambert. Oh, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> they came in there for reggae music, and we're, we're going boom chick boom chick boom chick boom chick, <laughs> you know. Oh, it was, it was incredible. But, uh, yeah, I, I do remember that. So it, it did happen. Uh, Nick, and I, Nick, Nick and I and Ned played the longest, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, of uh, uh, And Nick and I have been playing together almost 50 years now. Right. You know, and uh, so, of course, now he's in the Daredevils, which is a, a cool thing. That's, that's and uh, he's, you know, he's crazy, crazy as a nut. I mean, he's a nut. But he's uh, he's brilliant on mm -hmm. guitar. He's a brilliant guitar player, harmonica. He, you know, he's just he's a great musician. Just a great musician. There were um, since I had to talk about Route 66. There there were uh, several music venues operating on Route 66 in the 1970s, and you sort of alluded to that, uh, which are of particular interest to us for this project. I'd like to know if you have any memories of some of these places, like on St. Louis, the hangar. Oh yeah, yeah. The, those I I never personally played the hangar. Okay. Those were primarily the Jim Wonderleys and the Fools Faces and mm -hmm. the and the East End Kids. Did you go? Oh yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Brad Peterson owned it, yeah. and I I ended up playing for uh, Brad when he owned that Missouri hotel thing that went into the old Bars building down on the square. The Missouri, uh, it was it was a a, a a bar restaurant made 
to, you know, uh, about, you know, in honor of Missouri, all things Missouri. Was that Butterfields? Butterfields, right. Yeah, right. Right. Is, how close is that to the museum? It's right next in the door. Building, yeah. right? It's in that building, right? Yeah. 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 It would have been in that building. Yeah, that's what I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it was the old Bars building, and uh, I don't know if you remember the Bars building, but it was a men's clothing store. And uh, I played for him there. I played, uh, I was just saying, uh, out on West Sunshine, there was, you know, there were some re really wild clubs. Uh, well, one of them, and I can't remember the name of the club. I want to say Alibi, but that's not right. Yes, Alibi is right. There is an alibi. It, yep. it, yeah. it, well, it, and it, of course, the Alibi was at several different places yeah. at several different times. And, and, but it's now, uh, they sell golf carts. If you go out West Sunshine, just on your right, there's a big old long building, and they used to sell golf carts. I don't know what they're selling now. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, and I, I remember there were two old men that owned it. And uh, they, they played, I mean, old stuff, old stuff. And then they had Alan and I come in with some other people and, and uh, uh, play for the kids, uh -huh. you know, younger people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we played there. Uh, I played uh, uh, below the bowling alley that was on Battlefield, mm -hmm. that place a lot. Uh, that's where I first met Charlie McCall, who would eventually become... Uh, he played with a band called Zachary Bow, and he would eventually become road manager for the Daredevils. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, one of the places that's no longer in existence was uh, on coming in on St. Louis Street from Glenstone to the square, there used to be an Otasco Tire and Supply right across from that building that, on Jefferson. Yeah. And yeah, there was no Tasco Tire and Supply there. And Ray Rutledge owned it, who would eventually open Ray Moans out on Sunshine. Uh -huh. And uh, it, it was, uh, and I think it was called the Alibi, too. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, like you said, there was there were several yeah. locations for the Alibi. I believe there was one on Glenstone at one point. Right. Yeah. 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 There was one. Yeah. Betty Mahan and all those boys played there, and I, I did. And then, of course, Half a Hill was like. Right. I played there a million times. Down at Battlefield. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, uh, we played there a million times. But the Ray, Raymond Rutledge that eventually would open Raymond's uh, had that bar up there uh, above Otasco Tire and Supply. You had to go up two flights of stairs to get there. And uh, John, John, John Sellers told us about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how some guy came flying down the stairway because they were kicking him out. And oh, they yeah, they just used to throw people. <laughs> they, they just go, boom, hit the door, <laughs> fall out on the concrete. You know? it was, he did that all the time. I mean, anyway, oh that you know, that's the thing I can't get today is is that you hardly ever see a fight. I, I haven't seen a fight at a club in decades. Mm -hmm. You know. And it was everywhere all the time Rally, when yeah. we were young. Mm -hmm. It was everywhere, everywhere, you know. Did you ever play at the Regency on St. Louis? I did not. That was kind of after my time. Okay. Right. And uh, uh, I did play a lot. Nick and I played a lot of, of places that were clubs, but they were, you know, parties or, or uh, uh you know, uh, I played a lot of the Schultz and Dooley's. I played uh, before it was Schultz and Dooley's. I'm trying to remember what it was called. Um, man, I played for years uh, a solo at uh, the uh, what is now Jim's that used to be yeah, Steak the Steak and Ale, Ale right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Played there in that bar forever, and uh, even played at the uh, uh, the what used to be the Ramada at the corner of Glenstone and Sunshine, they had a, a grand piano there. I played that for Tracy Kimberlin forever. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah. I, did you um, did you play at the Hitchin Post Lounge on Carney? Yeah. Yeah. Would that would would that have still been Route sixty six at that time? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. That that was also a. Uh, um, no, that wasn't Raymond. That was a. <coughs> what was his name? 
Do you remember his name? I don't. I, just I can see article. him right now. He was a, he was a something. <laughs> Lurby. Yes, Carl Lurby. That's right. That was Carl Lurby's place. And, um, yeah, it was a, uh, it was kind of, I, he, he kind of patterned it after, uh, uh, what's his name that used to be in Branson? Had that big Texas place. Mickey Gilly. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. It was kind of that kind of place, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, we played at the Rendezvous. We played at the Colonial Hotel a million times. Oh, yeah. You know. Did you play at Kentwood? Oh, Kentwood, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you ever play in the uh, in the um, the Fox and Hounds lounge in there, or did you just play in the ballroom? <coughs> we just played the ballrooms. Mm -hmm. That was back in the kind of the uh, frat days. A lot of frat parties were there. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where we, a, a lot of times, I'd run into Jim Wonderly or Jimmy Frank or some of those guys that, and they'd have a, a gig going on there too, you know, mm -hmm. we just two different ballrooms. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Fox and Hounds, Nick Sibley played a, a quite a bit there with Jody Troutman, I remember. And uh, yeah, that, that's all about it. They played a lot of jazz at the, um, at the Fox and Hounds. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, there were, oh man, there was, you know, we had Wayne Carson here. We had a bunch of writers here, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. Uh, and Nick and I and Lloyd Hicks, who's dead, and God, everybody's dead. Uh, yeah, no kidding. David Pease, he's dead. Uh, Nick and I, I, I got this picture I want to show Nick with all of us that used to do uh, Cy Simon's recordings, mm -hmm. you know, for his artists. We do his sessions, and uh, the only ones alive are Nick and I. Wow, that's something. You know, still, and uh, I think, thank God, we're in pretty good shape. But yeah, uh, they're they're all dead. Uh, but we used to do, you know, uh, people used to come here from all over the country, you know, because Wayne wrote their songs. Right, mm -hmm. right. And Nick and I uh, started playing at a place called Ground Round out on. Uh, North Kearney. Was that it? It was right next to the uh, the Howard Johnsons uh -huh. when it was open. That's probably not the right. It was owned by the company that owned Grand Round. I can't remember. P.J. Brennan's. That's what the name oh, okay. of it was. And uh, we played there uh, for Charlie Foss, who would eventually own uh, all the Shelton Doodleys and, and that. Uh, what kind of place was that? It was a steak place, kind of like mm -hmm. uh, uh, Steak and Ale, uh -huh. Jim's. Mm -hmm. And uh, we played there a lot. And uh, my, Wayne would come, you know, when he'd wine and dine these people, he, they'd come out. And hell, we, I mean, you know, one night we'd, it'd be, uh, uh, oh, uh, Vicki Mantle, and who the, who was that, George, or what, who, he had black hair. And, he was a real, uh, he was a manager, and uh, you're probably too young to remember. But anyway, they, they you, you just never knew who was going to be there. I mean, sometimes it was B.J. Thomas, and, oh, cool. and yeah. uh, you know, uh, he, Wayne wrote, Little bit of love is better than no love, even a bad love is better that. than no love. And, uh, uh, of course, he did the box tops hit, uh, Give me a, a ticket, ticket for, for an airplane. airplane. Yeah, it's a great song. Yeah, the letter. Yeah. And uh, that's one of the most recorded songs ever. Oh, yeah. You know, Cocker did another version of it. Did, and a yeah. lot of people don't know the Joe Cocker version of it. Yeah, yeah everybody yeah. did. That's sure. the way I do it. Uh -huh. is the, because I, I kind of grew up w around uh, Leon Russell in Tulsa. I worked at Tulsa Studios sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I got to work with all of his people. Jamie O'Decker that played with uh, Eric Clapton. And... Uh, uh, there was it was it was just a cool the Ozarks had a lot of great musicians you know that's very interesting that you talk about celebrities coming oh through. yeah I'm not not that you all weren't celebrities too oh but, we weren't but, but, but we I, weren't but I just think about that as a as, as so many times we we've heard people tell stories of of people coming through you know uh, oh, yeah. and stopping here so I mean all a, the time what an opportunity oh yeah to all meet the some time. People. Uh, I can't imagine it was ever any other way because, you know, uh, like I said, you know, uh, uh, Chet Atkins was here. Yeah. 
you know, and the only reason, you know, and we kind of, I don't, I don't know, I don't know the exact history, but somehow we lost the opportunity to keep the Grand Ole Opry right here. Right, yeah. The Ozark and, Jubilee, yeah. 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 It, it could have been it had five years. And could then, have been right here. Yeah, you know, it, it was hard to compete with the coast as as it got. Yeah, as you, as you went along. You yeah. know, and uh, we we uh, we had some great musicians. I mean, uh, uh, Speedy Hallworth. Yes. Whoa, he was an incredible guitar player. And Slim Wilson was a good writer. He was a good singer. You know. Yeah. Uh, there was just so many. I mean, they all lived right here. Uh, Tall Timber Boys. That was oh yeah, the, Tall Timber yeah, Trio. Yeah, the trio. Yeah, yeah and uh, uh, June Carter, her family lived right off Elm Street in an old mansion. There's a, a parking lot there now where the mansion was, but mm -hmm. that was the Carter sure. mansion. And, uh, um, you know, it, there, there just were always, ever since I started playing music, there were always a lot of musicians here. I mean, all the time. And I just got lucky and got in with the right folks, you know. I was never a great piano player. I, you know, I was never a great singer. I was just, uh, but uh, I was funny. And, and I could uh, get along with everybody. And I, I, I was good at, at taking direction, you know. And to this day, I sing Country Girl, and I sing it like uh, Randall Channing. Mm -hmm. I don't try to sing it like Rural Chapel, I sing it like Randall Channing because that's what the people remember. Yeah. You right. know? So that's, I um, mean, uh, you know, it, it's never been, I've never been accomplished for my music skills. It's more for just my people skills, I think. You know, I'm not afraid to, to I, I'm a team player, you know? I, I, I love that about, I love being a team player. Plus you're a hell of a musician. I love that. <laughs> um, it, this, this is where we get into the more philosophical kind of questions that she's probably already already um, passed by you, but and, and we we wish we had done we've talked about we wish we'd done this project 15 years ago um, yeah. because of Route 66 it it lost its commission in the mid 1980s right so by the time you were you were coming along Route 66 was already um, I think not as significant as it had been no. because there right. were other other avenues of, of transportation by then. So I'm curious to know, was Route 66 as the mother road in your consciousness during the time that you were coming along? I played Route 66 my entire life. Okay, so you, we, so we you played know this is Route 66 and that's why we're, you know. That, right. So, okay. Yeah, I, I played that. We played that in, in my first band. That's awesome. You know, and uh, it's always been. The Daredevils play it. Uh huh. And was it requested? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Nick Sibley sings it, you know. That's interesting. So what, it was requested in other parts of the country that where Route 66 doesn't go through at all. Right. No, uh -huh. I mean, yeah. it, it, you know, there were TV shows about Route right. 66. Right, yes, yes, yeah. right. And uh, so, I mean, it's got a, a legendary, it's legendary. You know, uh, even today, it's, mm -hmm. it's still legendary. Yeah, I think you know? we, we've talked about how it has enjoyed a resurgence. Actually. Right, and, and uh, I love it that we have a festival here. Right, That's sure. Really cool. And, uh, but yeah, we do, uh, every time we, uh, almost every time we play, especially if we, you know, if we're going to do a 30-minute set, we don't do it. But uh, if, we, you know, for some reason, TV or whatever, uh, we, we don't do it. But if we play a normal, you know, hour and 30 or or 70 minute, we, we, we do Route 66. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Nick and I sing it, as a matter of fact. I sing back up to him. That's great. And, uh, yeah, and uh, it, it's always been a song we did. I'm, every band I've ever been in. How about that? Yeah, um, it's a big deal. It was always a big deal. Do you think it was, um, do you think the fact that Route 66 came through Springfield, do you think that helped the music business here? Oh, I, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. You know, I mean, it, I know it was made, when KWTO was a big deal, they talked about Route 66 all the time. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was the route mm -hmm. through Springfield, Missouri. Yeah. And it, it, it's kind of like going from, uh, you know, I-55 go, you know, from East St. Louis all the way to Chicago. You know, it's, 
uh, it was the play. It was the way people traveled, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was the way you went to California. It was the way you know, you, you just took Route sixty six, and it was, uh, uh, it it, I mean, it was a big. I knew Route sixty six when I was a kid, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I can remember the radios, the, you know, hearing it on the radio, hearing the song, hearing, you know, mm -hmm. it just always was part of being in Springfield or the Ozarks in general. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, and a lot of culture came this way, you know. Uh, Springfield, uh, a lot of culture came uh, through Route 66. Uh, uh, whereas, the, like St. Louis, was uh, more of a Boston, you know. If if you go to St. Louis, go to Kansas City, mm -hmm. you know there there's a, uh, it, it's like two different worlds, you mm -hmm. know. One's a cow town, and one is uh, like a Boston influence, mm -hmm. East Coast mm -hmm. influence. Yeah. Well, a lot of the California and the the desert influence and the and Oklahoma and uh, you know. At, it, it is all uh, uh, that it came to us mm -hmm. by Route 66. I mm -hmm. mean, that's you know, people were driving, there were buses, uh, people didn't, you know, they flew, but they didn't fly as much. People drove, mm -hmm. and uh, so like Route 66 for Springfield was probably just as big as the Frisco was for Springfield. Mm -hmm. I mean, people, the, those were the two ways you traveled, you, you know, mm -hmm. primarily were train and car mm -hmm. or bus. And, uh, you know, Route 66 was the way that people could climb on a bus in California and come to Springfield or, or points beyond. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it was a cultural lifeline. Do you think, because we've talked about several clubs, uh, at music venues that were on R Route 66, whether they be Kearney or St. Louis, um, the square, do you think that they were conscious that, hey, it's smart to be on this road? Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, well I mean yeah I mean even the uh, the little uh, uh, drive up uh, what were they the the no, motor court yeah the motor yeah, courts they were just oh they were everywhere mm -hmm. you know and along Route sixty six mm -hmm. same here you know they we had those motor courts uh, that that served people that were just driving mm -hmm. you know they were just gonna stop sleep and get up and go mm -hmm. you know. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think Springfield was as much influenced by Route 66 as uh, as the Frisco, and the Frisco was a huge influence. Sure, on, you know the railroad was. Do you think it helped uh, to bring outside acts in? Like, well, we haven't even talked about the Shrine Mosque as a as a venue. Oh yeah, but um, uh, you know, uh, oh, uh, the the former president. Uh, Reagan. Reagan. Yeah. Played right. the right on the square, mm -hmm. and Bob uh, Ho played uh, the uh, Pythian Castle, mm -hmm. and you know all those guys were California guys. Right. Sure. And uh, so I mean they probably flew here, but the, you know I don't know, and uh, yeah I mean there's no doubt about it. We had yeah, we had uh, during the war they had the big bands came through here. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there just was always, and I don't know, I, I don't know much back past uh, the uh, Ozarks Jubilee. I know a lot of people that were involved in that, um, Shy Simon primarily, right, and uh, Wayne and and all those people. Gary Ellison, I guess, is still alive. He used to square dance uh, there. He's, he's in our project. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. 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 Well, he's a he's full of information. Yeah. You know, yeah. About Missouri and. and uh, uh, and he can probably remember more than me. <laughs> I, there was a there was a hazy time. <laughs> Can't imagine. Back yeah. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, I mean we we got a lot of uh, uh, well, you know, for instance, I knew when John Q brought uh, Ray Charles to play at Central. Yeah, that's. A I thought that is wild. Yeah. They, you know, Larry Lee and I went to see that. Funny story. Well, I can't say it. I can't. I, where I forgot we're taping. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's interesting because Springfield, especially then, was not a big city. No, it was no. a town. Yeah. And so for for some of those acts to be here. Yeah. Uh, I, I 
it seems like, I mean, even now, Springfield is considered by some as a secondary market. So to have the acts that were coming here then, those are kind of primary acts. Well, and it was, I know, I'm, I will guarantee you, because I know it's been this way my whole life here in Springfield, it was because they knew somebody. Mm -hmm. You know, Wayne knew everybody all over the country, all the, you know, Cy Simon knew everybody mm -hmm. all over the country, and, and I'm sure that that, you know, preceded, uh, it, it was true back before them. I mean, there there just have always been important people here that knew people from elsewhere that, that would come here if for nothing else but a favor, you know. Especially in the music business. Yeah, especially in the music business. And uh, I do think we had some of our, uh, the Hollywood people uh, made, uh, uh, sh showed up here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Springfield was, I, I heard, was very popular during vaudeville. And, of course, Route 66 right. would have been like the, you know, uh, the old vaudeville uh, days, they had all these houses that, uh, uh, you know, the vaudeville acts would stop and do and then move on. Yeah, Gary uh, talked quite a bit about Oh, I bet. That. He yeah. would know sure. that. Yeah, yeah, he did, yeah. Um, that, that was fascinating. I, I did not, I was not aware of that. So that was, that was cool. Well, man, that's way, way back before my time. Right, so, right. You know, um, I... There, we, we were talking about earlier that there's sort of a resurgence of interest in Route 66. Um, and there's a, there's certainly a considerable amount of nostalgia oh, yeah. associated with it now. Yeah. Um, do you think that Route 66 is romanticized or do you think, no, uh, that's, that's really the way it was. I mean, it was this important and it well, was I, this. Yeah. I think, I think that it's both. I uh -huh. think that it, it, it uh. It, it was, uh, it, well, like I said, I think it was a cultural lifeline for Springfield uh, from both from both ends, you know, the mm -hmm. east the, uh, here and the west here. Yeah. And I think it tied those two things together and allowed a lot of things to happen in Springfield that wouldn't have happened without it. And I think that there is a, definitely a, a, a romanticism about it, uh, you know, to a, a maybe a little quieter time, though I don't remember it that way I, you know I think we do that in our mind we sometimes think things are they were just wonderful back then and they weren't right they, right. they really weren't you know but uh, um, yeah people well and I can tell you I, it is something that we do from the stage when you know I can always tell uh, from the stage uh, the songs that people know and that's one of them Route they will sing with you how about that yeah they will sing with you does it matter what age they are? No. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, we, you know, well, and another thing that's just astounded me is we're in our 51st year mm -hmm. of being a band, and uh, we're going to do uh, the Grand Old Opry again this year uh, in Washington, D.C., and several really neat places. And uh, the uh, we have a lot of younger people showing up. Why I don't know, but we, but I mean yeah. they are, yeah. And uh, they they like the music, and they you know grew up with parents that that uh, showed them the music, and they and they I, you know it's I'm just I I'm kind of shocked actually, because like at the Grand Ole Opry, they they weren't all old people by uh -huh. any means, right? You know, uh, they they were country western fans or country fans, but they were not young. Mm -hmm. All of them. I mean, mm -hmm. there were a lot of uh, people that weren't born when we started. Oh, cool. You know? Yeah. And um, so that is, it is really cool. But to get back to the point, I think it, it, it's both ways. But you can tell the songs people know because they sing them. Mm -hmm. You know, I can sing it, I can see it from the stage. Yeah, So, sure. you know, everyone knows Jackie Blue. They get right, There's sure. not a way in the world we're ever going to get away without playing Jackie Blue. Of course. Blue. Chicken trade, same way. Mm -hmm. They just know it. Route 66 is one of those songs. You know? I, w I, I did not know that. Um, I'm glad like I say, we still do it today. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we still do it today. You know, you're, you were talking about how you traveled, when, when you started traveling with the band and seeing the country for the first time and going to all these places, there's a certain romanticism involved with that too. Oh yeah, just hitting the open road kind of thing. So I know I know you've got hours and hours of stories that you could that you could tell about 
almost missing the the trip back to Boston and so forth. I know you could tell those stories. Yeah. And there seems to be a romantic element to that too. That's almost mythic. Um, it is. And and Route sixty six sort of captures that. Oh yeah. That myth, you know. Yeah. I mean, it. it was it it was. You know, it, it, it kind of encapsulates the good, the bad, yeah. the, you know, the rich, the poor, the, it just, it, it, it just everything about life and, and what we know as culture uh, came in on that road from the west or the east, you know. Yeah, I, it's almost like Route 66 becomes both literally and figuratively a cross-section of the country. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, uh, I, I did an album uh, about the uh, Young Brothers Massacre. Mm -hmm. Happened here in 1932. Uh, uh, it was the largest law enforcement massacre in history up until 9-11. Happened right out here at uh, uh, just outside of town where the Walmart is. Mm -hmm. On a farm that's still there. And uh, they killed six out of seven police officers. I knew that uh, Frank Pike was the only one who survived. And as a little guy, I used to sit while well, my dad went, we went down to Cranks to the doctors. And I'd sit at the confectionery there. And Frank was usually there. And he'd tell me the story over and over. Well, I ended up doing an album about it. But uh, the one of the things that, that you know, they, they would do is use 66, they'd, they'd rob a bank in Kansas, run through Joplin, they'd stop in Joplin, just cross the state line because they were free. You know, there was no place to, mm -hmm. to get them. There was no FBI. Yeah. And so then they'd run, they'd uh, uh, run to, uh, Joplin was one of their hiding places. There were, Joplin has big, big, you know, <laughs> it, it, it has a very colorful past, you know. Yeah. And so there were a lot of people down there would hide them, and then they'd come to Springfield or, or somewhere about some rob a bank, they'd go to Eureka Springs. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's where the mobsters did. They, they jumped borders. Right. And Route 66 through Joplin, Missouri was, was hot the pathways. with those guys. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, it's the good, the, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's all there. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, yeah, I can remember when, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, it was just, I, I, I never thought about that until you brought it up. But yeah, I mean, Route 66 is a song that everybody knows that is, to that this is day. Amazing. And it's not on the radio. Right, know? right. So, no. pretty I, strange. And yeah, a lot of people no. do it. I can I could remember the last time I actually heard it. You know, I, I can hear Nat King Cole singing it right now, but I just can't remember the last time I actually yeah. heard it, you know. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. What, what am I leaving out? Well, I want to hear more about the sessions at KWTO. Well, my very first, when you was very yeah, my very, I was a little bitty. I got, uh, there was a guy that wanted to cut a couple of tunes, and I had never done it before. And uh, I had to play a piano. It was mono. You know, there was no stereo yet. There was no tape. It was direct to disc. And so uh, you literally, it, there used to be places, uh, I think Jupiter had one on the square. Uh, you can still, the, it, there's, an, there's some nostalgia places that have them. Mm -hmm. And you can go in and cut a record, you know, it just cuts a record, one. And uh, that's how it was my first time at KWTO was, uh, it was for Robert Deal. And uh, he had a song called Mr. Magic Man. And I can't remember how it went, but I remember the name of it. And uh, we uh, uh, literally sang. I mean, it was straight up. No, no punching in, no fixing anything, just straight up. One mic. And we, you, you, the way you did it back in those days was you, your position juxtaposed to the mic was, you know, if you played a soft instrument, you had to be up closer, you know, uh, and uh, then if you played like, you know, a louder instrument, like I, string bass was always up close and everyone else was back a little bit. Guitar, you know, midway. And uh, vocals the same way, you know. And you just had to learn how to... It, that's funny because I, I, I think about this all the time. See, 
we trust now sound people to mix us. Yes. Mm -hmm. But see, when Nick and I started, you mixed yourself from the stage. Yeah, live. You're mixing yeah, yourself. Yeah, you just, you, mm -hmm. if, you know, you, you never oversang the guy next to you. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, if you were singing lead, of course you were louder, but if you were singing harmonies, you sang the same volume. It was, you know. It's almost like choir training. Well, yeah, I mean, it yeah. was, and that's the way you did it. Yeah. That's the way we grew up doing it. In fact, when Nick and I first started playing, they had these sound people that, you know, considered themselves sound people, and they they would show up at our gig and, and uh, want to, you know, push and pull knobs, and we'd say, just leave, just go away. We don't want anyone, just set it and let us do it. And we, we did our own. Mm -hmm. You know, if we, if uh, Nick had a, a guitar solo, he leaned into his microphone, you know, yeah. and uh, it's just the way we did it. I mean, you know, and if, if I needed to play piano softer, I did, you know, it was, that's how we mixed back then. That's how we grew up doing it, yeah. you know. That's not easy to do. Yeah. Not any, I don't think anybody does that anymore. I keep trying to convince the Daredevils to do it, but they, I don't know, you, you know, John's a little hard of hearing, so that doesn't help, and, uh, but, uh, you know the it it just was the way it was so yeah the first uh, the first thing i came home with was uh one record you know and so it to show it to anybody you had to take the record and find a record player <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean it was just whose it, idea was it to do that the the uh, recording uh, robert this robert deal guy Okay, and why did he want it? Well, he wanted to, I mean, he wanted to show it, pass it around. In those days, I mean, the people, uh, when you had a record, you just drove from radio station to radio station. Interesting, yeah. You know, and said, here, put this on, you know, and paid them a little bit, you know. Mm -hmm. That's where payola came into, the That's idea of payola. something. Oh, it happened all the time, That's you know. Something. They just show up and... Uh, uh, yeah, that uh, see, they, it's not realistic, but uh, you ever see the movie Bro Old Brother? Where I, yeah, I was, it's yeah, exactly what I was thinking. thinking. Yeah, that's, <laughs> exactly. that's, that's the way it happened. Yeah. That is exactly you know, what the, I was and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's exactly the way it happened. And were you playing on the? Did they play it on the local radio? Yeah, yeah. Okay, they, was that a rush? I mean, for you? Oh yeah. Oh God, yes. Was that giving you bragging rights? Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I never, I never. I, I, I'd never done anything like that before, and, and it was just a, a huge deal. And immediately, I grew up in a rough part of town. I grew up on Nickel Street, went to Central and Pipkin. And, and I mean, I grew up with some legendary tough guys, you know, like the Gardner Brothers and the Tyndalls and the, I mean, you know, these people were not, you know, you know, you did not want to piss them off. And, and uh, man, once I started playing music, I was their guy. Anyone gives you any crap, you call me, you know. <laughs> okay. So I skated. I just skated through. I was, I was untouchable, man. No one messed with me. And uh, I, I, they, all those guys would show up at, at uh, uh, Raymond's place above Otasco Tire and Supply, and they'd sit out there and drink beer, and, and uh, that's, they'd get drunk and say, anyone messes with you, you, you know. <laughs> Oh, it's the truth. I mean, That's it was great. the truth. Me and my brother, you know, we were little kids. See, we weren't old enough to be in there. And, uh, uh, it, it, you know, we started playing. Like I said, my, I couldn't even drive. Right. My mom had to drive us around. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we started really early and uh, probably saw a lot of things that most kids don't see at that age. I bet. But uh, nonetheless, I mean, it was great. I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it any different. Mm -hmm. You know, now looking back, I wouldn't do any different. When did you start growing your hair out? I started immediately when I saw the Beatles. Uh -huh. Everyone did. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, those that could get by with it. My, my dad was a railroader, so he was out three days and home a couple and then out three days. And mm -hmm. So uh, he hated it. He was a military guy, loved Elvis Presley. I remember... Uh, 64, we were sitting on the couch watching uh, Ed Sullivan <laughs> and the Beatles played. And my dad said, ah, they're just a flash of the pan, man. They ain't going to be nobody. There were a lot of very 
very influential critics who made a lot of money saying the same oh, thing. Oh, the same thing. Let me tell you, newspapers. everybody's <laughs> dad said, <laughs> Elvis Presley was their guy, you know, Elvis yeah. Presley. And, uh, uh, and I knew right then things would never be the same. How about that? I mean, I knew it. Anybody that was turned toward music, you know, it was all the buzz. I mean, you know, the very next day in school, it was like, man, did you see that? You know, and it was, uh, uh, hey, it was cool. Do you yeah. remember the first time you saw the Stones? Well, it was on Ed Sullivan. Okay. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> those guys are another, you know, I, Nick and I went to a couple of their concerts. They're just, you know, I did get to, uh, we just finished a cruise uh, this last year. Uh, on uh, it was called the Rock Legends Cruise, and Roger Daltrey was on oh, board, yeah. and we got to hang with him and talk with him, and it oh, was the cool coolest. You know, I never got to meet any one of the Beatles. Wanted to really bad. Uh, never got to meet any of the Stones personally. Wanted to got to meet the Eagles and all that stuff, but I never got to meet the three bands. You know, the 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 uh, Beatles, the Stones, and the Who. And the Who yeah. And so I got one of them. That's great. And he was just the nicest guy in the How world. Oh, he was great. He was just nice as he could be. And he told us, he said, I've always wanted to play music like this, <laughs> like us. That's great. He went to our concert. And That's said, fabulous. Oh, I know. That's a rush. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. I, you know, even at this age, I still got chills. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can imagine. He said, uh, uh, his last concert, he said, man, I really enjoyed going to hear the Daredevil. That was just, you that's know, and to have someone like that say that. Oh, that's fabulous. And he's, you know, he'll be 80 this next year. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, that's hard to believe, too. Anything else? Yeah, actually, on the way up, we were talking about you and Ernie went to, Ernie Bedell went right. to Central together. So you're talking about the Ed Sullivan show the next day. Are you all comparing notes on your shows and the travels that you were doing during high school? Oh, well, Ernie and them, uh, they... They had a band uh, that was playing in the area too. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was uh, uh, Kansas City Express. KC Express. Yeah. And there was one before that. I just can't remember the name, but KC Express. The was, Fabulous Elites. Yeah. Okay, there, yeah. there you go. And uh, you know the uh, Don Schiff's dad owned a uh, electric company in town, and my dad rebuilt all these little cracker box houses on. Uh, on Nickel Street, and uh, when someone would die or or move, uh, he'd buy them. And so we owned, I mean, these one, you know, two bedroom, one bath, little cracker box houses. And uh, and uh, Mr. Schiff's did all our electrical work, and uh, uh, Bebop Brown did all our plumbing. Uh -huh. And uh, so I got to hang with those guys even when I was really young, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then later I would get to play with them, uh, whether they were playing. There was a, a, a club right on the corner across from the hotel where that motor court is. There was a club right there. I want to say Quest or something like that. But, uh, but they played there a lot. They played the Lamplighter. They played... Uh, Oh, uh, the the hotel downtown, and um, oh, and Howard Johnson's. They played at Howard Johnson's bar, mm -hmm. and Dallas Bartley was uh, just such a sweet man, and he he kind of took me under his wing, and uh, he was playing with uh, 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 Betts, Bob Betts. And Bob was uh, a great piano player, but he had frostbitten hands. And how he played, I don't know. Uh, he, uh, uh, he got left outside. He was blind. Mm. And I, uh, he got left outside somehow. He couldn't get in his house. And uh, he had frostbite, but he played, and he was so good. And uh, uh, Dallas and Bebop. And uh, they were so good. And they, I used to go listen to them uh, just because 
they just, you know, they just had that soul that no one else had. Yeah, they were legendary by then. Oh, probably. God, yeah. Sure. yeah. Well, you know, Dallas played with uh, Ella Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, wrote a song for her, and, um, yeah. and uh, I can see him today. <laughs> he's a great, he's a, he was a good guy. All those guys were great to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, David L., uh, Ernie's uncle, I think is right, there's a bunch of Bedells. Yeah. Hey, bunch. Yeah, we know. <laughs> and uh, I went to school with all of them. And uh, Larry Bedell's a great singer. Uh, Dave Bedell owned the drum key. Right, yeah. My brother bought his first set of drums there. Really? Yeah. And uh, uh, Dave was a, was a really good drummer, jazz drummer. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I mean, they just, they, there was so much talent here. You could, you know, if you wanted to be a musician, there was tons of people to listen to regardless mm -hmm. of, of what style you liked, you know. I mean, it, 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 was, it was right here. And uh, so in that way, Springfield, we were lucky. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't have to just listen to the radio, and a lot of kids had to do that. Right. You know, that grew up and wanted to be musicians. They had, they, they had to listen to the radio or or, uh, you know, get travel to go see their idols, you know. Uh, we had them right here. You had live music every week here. Oh, yeah. yeah oh, like I said, we used to have 10 places between St. Louis and Glenstone to the square. Yeah, that's phenomenal. You know, just in that bit of town, there were that many places. Everyone had a place to play. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. all the time. And uh, it, was, it was a great place to play. What was that little club that... Ernie Bedell talked about that they played and went to the get across the street to get the hamburgers. You know, oh, um, it was close. It's kind of close to the Shrine Mosque, wasn't it? The upbeat or that? Oh, the downbeat. 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 Yeah, the <laughs> downbeat. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I I never played it's there, but that was a great numbers. club, and I I did go see them there. And uh, yeah, the downbeat club. Yeah. 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 That was sort of like a that was a sort of a teen club, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, the the uh, uh, the you know uh, Ernie and his group they were they were just they were funky I mean and, and that uh, I they they were good they were sort of big too I mean oh it, yeah it, it's like the like the an early version of Earth Wind and Fire oh I mean. yeah oh yeah no they were see yeah. I mean you know it was uh, uh, James Brown uh, it was that time mm -hmm. and yep. uh, you know James Brown came to town. Right, and uh, that was that always shocked me that that he did that because he was hot, man. Yeah, you know, and controversial. And, yeah. yeah, and uh, but the boy, they filled the shrine mosque. I mean, he filled the shrine like no one's business. And I uh, think that's fascinating. Oh yeah, yeah. oh yeah. Well, if people love to have fun to the music. They just hated it that they, they were black. Well, I can't. You know? That's what I thought because we've had some other people talk about the James Brown appearance at the at the Shrine Mosque, and I couldn't help but believe that there were plenty of people in that audience that had been bad mouthing him for. Oh, for I'm as sure long there were. As you can remember, and yet they went to see him. Well, you know that's the problem with that's the problem. <laughs> Is I, I have grew up in a Southern family. I am no. I mean, I am very aware of racism. Sure. You know, I grew up with it. Sure. Uh, thank God my mother and my dad uh, said, no way, we're not doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. And uh, er, uh, I had black friends uh, uh, stay over at my house. I, had, You know, they ate at my table. They, uh, um, Everyone was welcome at my house. Mm -hmm. No, there was, uh, no, color wasn't a thing. And, uh, but... Uh, it, it, it was, uh, you know, it's, and here we're, we're still struggling with it. Sure. You know? Yeah. Know. Today. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, I mean, this was happening when I was born. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and, and it's like we're redoing everything from the 30s up. Yeah. You know, right. in, in a condensed time period. Right, right. You know, uh, just everything about it, but... Uh, I, 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 there was just some, oh, I'll tell you, the, the very first time I played with the Daredevils, <laughs> we, uh, my first tour with them, we went to, uh, we went to play uh, uh, in concert, Don Kirshner's in concert. Oh, yeah. And uh, so we get there, 
and you know we're all I can tell you a million stories this is you know and but we you know we're in our daredevils you know um, shirts I mean our you know like the felt not felt but what was it Pla uh, what do you call it like flannel flannel yeah. shirts and work boots and, you know and, and and we had to follow uh, not Tower of Power, but uh, oh God, who was it? Uh, it was like a Tower of Power group, it, 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 and I just I was going. We're going to do Chicken Train after that. <laughs> <laughs> I was scared to death. I was literally scared to death, and it went fine. It, it reminded me of the first time we played the Roxy. I mean, the, 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 it was a, you know, uh, Sex Pistols were hot, and, and the, you know, the curtain opened, and here were all these guys with spiked hair, and just, you know, and I looked at them, and I, and John started on the barring, you know, on the mouth bow, you know, and I thought, oh my God, it'll be luck, we'll be lucky to get out of here alive. <laughs> <laughs> and you know they sat there for a while like and, and I could see them I could see what they were saying they were saying man there really are people like this <laughs> you know and you were looking at them and yeah, I was thinking the same thing right you guys are the weirdest people I've ever seen in my life and they were you know they looked at us like we were from Mars I mean, they, were, they couldn't believe that there was anyone that dressed like that and you know and and uh, but by the end of chicken train, they were they were you know they were with it. And but uh, yeah, that, cultural deals, man. But uh, I, I never will I never will forget bebop and, and uh, uh, those guys. They, you know, Dallas and yeah, Bob Betts. They 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 had a lot to do with uh, with culture and in, in, in music. You know, and bebop owned the club. Right, the bebop. Yeah. And that guy got raided all the time. And, I, I don't know how many times I and tons of other people would have to go hide in the woods real quick to avoid the sheriff, you know, drinking underage in there and, and stuff, you know. That was just, there was just a lot of that back then, and, and now, today, not so much. Mm -hmm. Well, I told you during, oh, one more thing, sorry. Sure. That's right. <laughs> While we were researching you, the connection with Beth Spindler and the Jazz Association and Chuck, uh, Francisco. Yep, Chuck Francisco. I remember him. He's no longer with us. Mm -hmm. Beth is. Yes. Uh, Beth yes. had. We a, interviewed her as well. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. I yeah. love Beth. Yeah, she's great. She's a yeah. and she has a great voice, and uh, she uh, uh, does yoga now. Yes. yes. And uh, which is you know she's always been real smart, and real cool, and uh, Tassie Helwig was another one that sang jazz around here. Rocky's uh, girl. And uh, uh, yeah, they you know uh, those guys were uh, Johnny Strickler. Nice. Have you got mm -hmm. to talk to him? No. Well, you ought to look up Johnny and uh, um, God. I'll come up with it. I'll email you. Okay, that'd be perfect. Richard Bruton. I have the name. I don't know that I've got the whole thing though. Yeah, Richard Bruton. He's a sax player, a jazz sax player. Hates every other kind of music, but he loves jazz, and uh, you know he's the true jazz player. Really? And kind of like Strickland. See, it, I, I don't know if it's Strickler or Strickland, but okay. uh, Johnny, and uh, they're great, 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 great people. Uh, you know, even back in the old country days, Chet Atkins and them, they were they were they were definitely jazz players. Mm -hmm. You know that that right. finger and stuff they did in a, in a country western venue, but it was jazz. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. so there was a lot of mixture of stuff going on there, and uh, you know, Speedy Hallworth and they were just incredible. Yeah, Speedy, incredible. It, we we have uh, we have a one of the Ozark Jubilee episodes with Speedy playing. It is one of the most popular episodes. I mean, I've had people email me and send me messages on Facebook. Oh, how so, cool. Yeah, they think it is. And these guys are in their 30s who are, who are just oh, yeah. amazed, you know, at Speedy Hall. Yeah. The, uh, Speedy uh, was just the nicest guy, and he was just always so good. I would love to see that sometime. 
Well, Carl Perkins too. He oh was yeah, on, he was on one episode. Now, when that when we aired that one, when we when we posted that one. I had guys like Justin Larkin and all, they were all messaging me and saying, God, I didn't know this existed. You know, I mean, they oh, were yeah. just going crazy about it. Everyone was here. Yeah. Everyone just, was here. Well, you know, I, I, one of my good friends uh, that was, uh, what's his name at KWTO, the owner, Ralph, Ralph, Ralph Foster. Foster. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, his right hand man, Virgil Phillips, was my one of my best friends, and he lived to be 104. And I used to take him to lunch every week, and he'd tell me old stories. And uh, one of the funny ones was uh, Chet Atkins got to the point that he didn't, he didn't want to do the road shows. And the road shows was how they sold KWTO. Right. You know? Yeah. They, they'd, they'd go do road shows and say, now listen to us on KWTO, mm -hmm. and, and that's how they, you know, and then they'd run ads, and that's how they charged their people to run ads. And... Uh, Ralph Foster told uh, Virgil, "Well, we're going to have to let Chet go. We're just going to have to let him go. He won't. He won't do the road shows anymore. I just, you know, he won't. And so we got to let him go." And Virgil said, "Are you sure? You know, you want to do that? Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not going to pay him if he won't do the road shows." Okay. So he goes down. <laughs> he said, "Man, that was the longest walk downstairs <laughs> to go talk to Chet Atkins." And, you know, he wasn't the Chet Atkins of, you know, the, with the, the legend right. at that point. But he was, everyone knew he was a killer. And uh, Burgess said, he started off, he said, uh, now Chet, you're one of my best guitar players. And Chet said, I am your best guitar player. <laughs> And then he had to follow up with, I gotta let you go, Chet. And of course, Chet went immediately to Nashville. Yes. And the rest is history. Rest is history. Yeah. You know? Of course. And uh, yeah, so pretty pretty cool stuff. That's something. Yeah. Well, we could talk to you for hours. We could. We <laughs> oh, I got. Oh, I got we, so we've many. We've gone beyond being respectful. Jazz of the Crusaders. Yeah. Jazz Crusaders. That's who it was. We followed on Kirshner's show. Oh, that was the. And it was just I. I was young, I'm, you know, and I was just sitting there going, oh, my God, we're going to take the stage after this? You know, it was, oh, it was just, I was just scared to death. I just couldn't believe we were going to do it, you know. Uh, I also was on a bus one time with broke down uh, in Colorado, in the mountains in Colorado, and uh, the very first time Kirshner wanted us on his show, and uh, the Dares were always, you know, uh, Everyone wanted to move to L.A., and they went, nah, man, we're not doing that. Right. We won't stay here. And, uh, and I got to know the wisdom of that. But if, I remember being on there, and Stan Plesser, he's long dead too, but he got on the bus and sat down, and he said, hey, guys, Don Kirshner, we were going to go play uh, Vail, and uh, they were going to have a day off to ski. And uh, no one skied, but we were going to have a day off to ski. And uh, I didn't. And so uh, anyway, he said, hey, Don Kirshner wants you on his show tomorrow night. And they said, yeah, we're going to ski. And I had to sit there quiet. I could not believe what I was hearing. Mm -hmm. That was the highest rated show yeah. in the United States. And they went, mm. <laughs> And those are the stories of legend. Oh, about, I know. About the Daredevil. They just, I mean, they, they were and, and, not. And, and gives them so much respectability here. Oh, I know. I, yeah. Because that's all I've heard since I moved here. Yeah. They, story, they just, you know? they, they didn't want to, they didn't want to go to L.A. They right. didn't want to be an L.A. type. They didn't want to do any of that, you know. And, and uh, like I say, you know, it's like the, just a good old boy that learned to wait. And that's, there's real truth in that. You know, but I think about that, and Kirshner's, most of the bands that played on there, they're not around anymore, but guess who is around? Yeah, that's a fact. And I think we had to beg to get on the show. <laughs> our, our manager did. We didn't, but he did. That's great. So anyway. That's a great story. Well, thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank this. you. This I hope it was worth, it's worth doing.